And with my three girls I think of What about to do together No longer alone I'm a walking through the sand I will perfect rocket the land Knowing you are here with me My mother needs to read the Shonda The Shonda Why? Why? I go away. The dash on the. It's not okay. And I'll go anyway. I'll go, 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 go anyway. Hi, I'm Michael Leverts, and this is Fit to Be Read. Death by Nnedi Okorafor is a stunning, dark, and powerful African futurist novel heavy on fantasy with just a hint of sci-fi. The story is wondrous, but also brutal. There is sorcery, long desert trekking, and elements of spirituality in this magical and fit-to-be-read novel. While it is more fantasy than science fiction, I still included Who Fears Death in my top 150 science fiction books video as the future setting and allusions to advanced technologies give me just enough sci-fi vibe to gladly give it a placement in that video. If you haven't watched that top 150 video, click on the thumbnail that appears at the end of this episode. I would recommend this novel for readers who like fantasy and magic as much as they like science fiction or those who prefer a blend. I recommend it for fans of Frank Herbert's Dune and those who enjoyed that novel, especially because of the atmosphere of trekking through and surviving in the desert and interactions with sort of indigenous desert dwellers, mystical powers or abilities, and an individual character who just might be the one that the legends prophesized. As with each review on this channel, the episode will begin with a spoiler-free review, some character analysis, some plot summary for those who have not yet read the book. Following that, I'll announce a five likes and five dislikes segment that will include spoilers for those who've read the novel and really, really want some spoilers. Also, if you like the original lyrics in the intro, keep coming back to the channel to see what's in store each week. Who Fears Death is a difficult read at times as there are instances of severe rape and abuse. There is also reference to female circumcision in this book, so readers that are sensitive to either, I want to give you that heads up now before we get started. Onya Sonwu, a child of rape, is a first-person narrator and the main character in this novel. Fleeing the assault of the Nuru attack on her village, Onye's mother and other Okeke women fled the village to escape into the desert. The marauding Nuru soldiers and their leader killed the men and the boys of the village and pursued the women into the desert. Genocide was not the only evil that the Nuru brought with them. Rape torture and enslavement were likewise part of their M.O. When the Nuru leader and his soldiers surrounded the Okeke women in the desert, the first mention of extreme abuse and rape includes the impregnation of Onye's mother. Onye Sonwu is known as Ewu. Ewu is a designation given to those who are the product, usually through rape, of a Nuru man and an Okeke woman. The intentional impregnation of the Okeke women is yet another element of the weaponized rape and the power that the Nuru exact over them. Ewu are looked down upon by both sides. The story follows Onye and Ewu from her childhood, surviving and persevering this genocide to an adulthood in which she discovers her connection to magic and awareness to magical elements of her world. Onye Sonwu discovers her connection to this natural and magical world, and she at times comes across as an extension of the world as much as she does an individual. It takes the full story and full evolution of each character to fully appreciate this novel. 
Other notable characters in the story are Mitwa, an Awu boy with similar connections to the mystical world that Onye also navigates. There are Luyu, Binta, and Ditti, three girls that Onye has a specific bond with and who unfortunately, at first, lack any real distinction for a good early chunk of the book. Also significant in Onye's life is her obviously terrible birth father, her mother Najiba, her eventual stepfather, a blacksmith, and Aro, an elder of her town, Jawir, who also has a strong connection to things mystical. Nettie Okorafor's prose is always strong and often poetic, and her descriptions of the desert and the wilderness are no exception. Okorafor, through Onye's travel, and along with her not exactly likely crew of companions, through the desert brings Africa and future Sedan to life. As elegant as Okorafor's writing is in this book, there are parts that are difficult to read as they are extremely and unflinchingly brutal. She pulls no punches in imagining the worst parts of humanity and the darkest depths that sexual abuse could descend to. Avoiding such restraint delivers a very powerful, original, and relevant read. Along with her novels, Lagoon and Novella's Remote Control, and the Binti series, Akora Force Who Fears Death expands the boundaries of what science fiction literature can be and enhances the genre greatly. Who Fears Death is a fit-to-be-read novel featuring themes of religion and spirituality, magic and mysticism, racism and genocide, enhanced rape, misogyny, friendship, loyalty, destiny, and love. Here now are my five likes and five dislikes including spoilers, for Who Fears Death. Like number one, world building. I feel completely immersed in the world that Okorafor presents to us. The desert, the people, the traditions. It is a book and a world that is easy to get lost in. Dislike number one, the story told in first person narration works. There's one slip up for me that objectively is small, but it really bothered me. At one point in the storytelling, the story pauses with a, I'm getting ahead of myself, let me back up a bit. I'm no fan of this device, so much so that I'm giving this a full dislike. I think it diminishes the character. The bit that was missed was significant, making the, oh, let me, even more distracting. It pulls me out of the story too, because I'm thinking, um, you're writing the story, Nettie. If you thought you were forgetting something, just go back and fix it. Yes, I know it was an intentional device, that's sort of my point. A strength of the novel is how successfully it pulls you into this world and the atmosphere. This little thing pulling me out, it's unwelcomed. Dislike number two, the focus on the 11th right, it's uncomfortable. It's only a dislike in that I'm uncomfortable contemplating it. I appreciate female circumcision being discussed in the book for the sake of awareness. Also, early in the story, I feel like the practice was maybe being treated a little too respectfully. My feeling is that perhaps I viewed it incorrectly and it was really the children and their actions and the situation as a whole being treated respectfully and not the act that was being done to them. In the greater context of the story, the admonishing of female circumcision is made clearly and comprehensively. Like number two, also the focus on the 11th right. Books have so much power when they can evoke deep emotion, not trivial or gratuitous gimmicks to grab attention, but real moments. The whole process of Onya Sonwu arriving for and enduring the circumcision was one such real moment. It was hard to look at and read, but it was a real moment and a powerful reading experience. Dislike number three, itsy bitsy and ditsy. Her three friends are all pretty flat as characters and only really exist as an entity of three. Each has one sort of defining quality, but they're all still represented as a group. It became almost comical. All three of them entered through her window. She went up to all three of them. All three of them showed up at her door. In the second half of the novel, this is fixed as the three friends develop as individual characters and each in their own way, strengthen the whole of the story. Dislike number four, I enjoy that Onye's three friends are going with her into battle, but there's not enough in the text up to this point to support this feeling natural. The foundation is there, them having their bond, but there's still a few pieces missing. 
like number three. The attack of the wild dogs, the camels, gazelles, and hawks all teaming up. It came out of nowhere. It seemed ridiculous, but I really liked it. It added richness to the already magical feel of the desert. Dislike number five. In the second act, Mwita is revealing to Onye that her mother has Lucy abilities, and half of the passages are forced drama with Mwita pausing and reluctant and Onye bravely interrupting to say she can handle it. There was no reason for Mwita to be so dramatic, to withhold. There was nothing outrageously threatening to Onye's well-being in the content that he shared. The manufactured drama was too obvious. Like number four, it was a pivotal moment for me regarding my imaginary grade for this book when Onye grabbed the hand of the injured Okeke man, Oduwu, a man who had killed his pregnant, so-called evil, wife. Onye healing the man rather than killing him brought the novel to new heights. Either scenario could have worked, but her decision to heal elevated everything that came before and after. Like number five, it's hard to call this a like, but I list it here because the tragedy of it is a creation of a core force that enlists a brutality very unique in literature. She presents the idea that Onye's father, the new sorcerer, the rapist, worked juju on his army to enable them to rape beyond their normal physiological limits. To consider that the Okeke women being abused by the soldiers could be continually raped over and over again because the juju allowed for the soldiers to for lack of a better word, replenish their ejaculate and stamina is as horrible a physical abuse as I have read. The idea that the men would eventually get tired of their actions wasn't even a possibility. Thank you for watching and check out my Lagoon review if you're interested in more from this amazing author.